All right, so uh, welcome back. We're still on the topic of fluorescence here. And uh, lecture four, week two. Again, this uh, lecture is by Professor Attila. Give credit where credit is due. So we're going to go uh, through Attila's uh, lecture slides. We're going to talk a little bit about applications of uh, fluorophores. And really, when we're talking about applications of fluorophores, let me just get to that presentation, applications of fluorophores. Immunofluorescence is really the one example that I would use uh, when I was uh, when I'd been asked about give uh, give an example for application of uh, fluorophores. The rest are, are kind of uh, kind of loose. There's more to mention about immunofluorescence, uh, at least at this point, uh, with the knowledge we acquire. So I'm going to go through immunofluorescence specifically, and then uh, I'm going to describe the uh, workings and the functionality of the fluorescence microscope, which is something that we'll have to do in labs as well. So it's good to get it out of the way now. And we're going to discuss the uh, photobleaching uh, phenomenon. So let's get, uh, let's get going. So immunofluorescence. Immunofluorescence is basically a way of visualizing target molecules in a biological sample. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a cell. This is a cell. And it has let's just say, specific proteins on, on the surface of the cell, on the membrane itself. And let's say these blue, blue proteins are the same proteins, and these, these are my target molecule. This is my target molecule, which I want to see if I have. Molecule. Which I want to see if indeed exists on the surface of, uh, of this cell. What I do is I take antibodies, and antibodies are Y-shaped molecules which bind, this is an antibody, antibody, and each antibody is associated with a specific molecule it can bind to, and that specific molecule that it can bind to is called the antigen, antigen. So each antibody has a specific antigen. So I take antibodies that their specific antigens are my target molecules. And just so we know, we're not going to talk about the, anti, uh, the antibodies at length, but uh, this is where the, the, these two points are uh, the antigen binding sites right here, these two points. Not super important right now. The interesting thing is that I can, I can associate this antibody, I can stick it with a, some sort of fluorescent dye. So that means that if I take these antibodies and I introduce them in my samples, and if uh, I indeed have my specific target molecules, these antigens, my antibodies are going to stick to them. They're going to stick to them. Here and here. Everywhere, really. And these antigens, being that they have the uh, fluorophores attached to them, if I put this under a sample, let's just say that I put this in a fluorescent microscope, I will see these green dyes, which indicate that at these points, I have my target molecules. And that's immunofluorescence. It's basically using a fluorescent microscope and fluorescent dyes to uh, visualize and uh, indicate the uh, presence or absence of specific target molecules. This is the idea with uh, immunofluorescence. So uh, uh, let's just keep going with uh, the fluorescent microscope. And this is a nice depiction of the fluorescent microscope. What we have in the lecture slides, that is not it. What we have in the lecture slides is this. This is the depiction we have in the lecture slide. I, uh, I, I broke it down to somewhat of a more simple depiction, so it'll be easier to explain. So first of all, this is my light source. And uh, I believe that um, in the labs, we use something along the lines of a xenon arc lamp or uh, whatever arc lamp. It's just a light source that is polychromatic, meaning that we have all the um, different wavelengths of light here. And this is my sample here, my sample that contains fluorophore. And this is me. This is, let's just say, this is me looking down at the microscope. This is me. This is my eye. Perfect. 
So what happens here? Light of all wavelengths, light which is polychromatic, is entering the first filter, and this filter is the excitation filter. Excitation filter. And we all by now should know that fluorophores have the range in which they can be excited and the range in which they emit light. So the excitation filter just gives me the wavelengths that this specific fluorophore can be excited uh, with. So let's just say it's blue. It's just a very oversimplification. Let's just say it's blue. This is the blue photon. It's the only photon or it's the only range of wavelengths that goes through the excitation filter. It's the only wavelength I can use to excite this molecule. And the next thing that I have, the next filter or barrier, you could say, is the dichroic, this is a D here, the dichroic mirror. And what the dichroic mirror does is that for excitation, excitation wavelengths, it, it reflects. And for emission wavelengths, which is the wavelengths that the sample emits, it will be transparent. So, so let's see what this means really. I have my excitation light coming in and interacting with my dichroic mirror. Being that it's excitation light, it is going to be reflected. So it will be reflected down towards the sample. And it will interact with the sample. And being that it was exactly filtered by the excitation filter, it's the excitation of spectra. And I can use that to excite my molecule. And now my molecule will emit a photon as well. Here. There we go. Perfect. And this is my emission uh, photon or, or within my emission spectrum. Obviously, it was emitted by the fluorophore, and we're just going to oversimplify and say it's red. And let's see what happens when it gets to the dichroic mirror. It is within the emission wavelengths, so it's going, the uh, mirror itself is going to be transparent. That means that uh, photon which was emitted would be able to go through. Now the last filter is the emission uh, or the barrier filter, I believe. That's how it's called in the presentation, the emitted light barrier filter. You can also, there it is, you can also think of it as the emission filter. It would not be incorrect to say emission is the emission filter. And basically this only lets the emission spectrum light through to the other side. And you may say, wait a minute, it already happened here in the dichroic mirror. The dichroic mirror already did this little sorting thing. So why do I need to do this again? Well, this is just a redundancy, really. This, this little uh, barrier here, this little filter here is just a redundancy in case some of the excitation, uh, uh, the excitation spectrum somehow eludes the dichroic mirror or gets through. It would be stopped at the barrier filter. And that way I can use polychromatic light, which is going to be filtered. I'll switch colors here. I haven't used this one yet. So I can use polychromatic light. Over here is going to be filtered only to the excitation light. That excitation light is going to come down and interact with my molecule that is going to emit photons. Only those photons can be transparent to the dichroic mirror and can go through. And they're going to be uh, just to make sure that we don't have any excitation wavelength photons coming into our eye messing out our reading. We're going to have the last emission or barrier filter to make sure that we only have the emission wavelengths coming through, giving us a nice crisp reading. And uh, I just got a nice, nice depiction of uh, um, fluorescent microscope. I took this from the uh, web page of the undergraduate physics of York University. I believe it is in, uh, in Canada. And uh, this is the website, in case you're wondering. And this is just the same depiction. We have a mercury uh, arc lamp. And it goes in. You can see that it's polychromatic. All, all of the uh, uh, light waves, they, uh, <coughs> all the <coughs> sorry, light wavelengths, they have the excitation filter here. They interact with the object. The emitted light goes up, and it's, it is not reflected. It is 
transparent to the dichroic mirror, and there's the emission filter. Here they say emission. In, the, in our presentation, it's, it's called a barrier, but it is interchangeable. And then we have our eyepiece, and that's what we see. This is how the, uh, the fluorescent microscope works. It's, it's kind of a, it, it is a, a nice depiction, and it's very important to understand that you do need this for the labs as well. You need to understand it, and they may ask you about it. So uh, make a point to understand it, and uh, I think it's not, not too bad. Photobleaching. Now this is also um, a, an image taken from the same uh, website of the undergraduate uh, physics of York University in Canada. Hopefully I'm getting this right. I believe they're in Canada. And this is uh, exactly where I took this uh, picture from. And this is photobleaching. What is photobleaching? Let's just say I have my fluor 4. And my fluor 4 can, uh, let's just say, be excited by um, a specific wavelength of light and emit a specific wavelength of light. This is all uh, nice and dandy, but what happens if I bombard this molecule with high intensity light, super high intensity, lots and lots of photons, very, very photon dense, photon rich, through a long amount of time. What would happen is the chemical composition of this molecule is going to be compromised. And what happens is that slowly it would lose, slowly it would lose the ability to fluoresce. It'll slowly lose its ability. What you may imagine that may take place, let's just say I have some sort of molecule here. Not really sure what I'm drawing, but there's some sort of molecule here. And when I'm applying high intensity light, it may cause one of these, uh, let's just say one of these bonds here, one of these bonds here to break. Maybe uh, this bond breaks. Maybe that bond breaks, maybe this bond breaks. And if you uh, want to have a nice, I think we, in the uh, presentation itself, I think we have a nice uh, x ray crystallography depicted uh, photo bleaching. Uh, there we go. This is x ray crystallography uh, depicted photo bleaching event. On the left side, you will see the molecule as is when it has fluorescent abilities. And on the right side, you will see the uh, a chemical composition that gets compromised. And when it gets to that point, the point on the right side, it loses its ability to fluoresce. And uh, if you're wondering why would I use it, there are different uses for photobleaching. Maybe we'll cover this later um, when we talk about uh, FRAP. But that's later in the course. That's more second uh, self-control test related material, I believe. And that's pretty much it for the topics today. Hopefully you've had uh, You've had a helpful hand with this video, and we'll see you in the next video.